So now we want to take a look at my best recommended toys here for stage five. And let's review our primary focuses one more time. We want to see toys that we can use for combining. We want to use very familiar objects that are appropriate for pretending things that they see other people do during everyday routines. And we also want to discuss that next step up for that fine motor maturation and for cognitive toys too. So let's start with those toys and take a look at some of those now. So let's begin by looking at some early puzzles. And by early puzzles, I mean puzzles with just a few pieces with these jumbo knobs, because this is gonna, again, make it easier for that fine motor development that we've been talking about. And here we're, we're talking about their, a child's ability to take that jumbo knob here and get the piece in the right place and get it you know in that inset puzzle so we introduced puzzles way back in stage two and remember you know all the way up here at stage five let's just kind of talk about that progression back at stage two we were just had those single puzzles that say that uh, the circle with the mirror in there and the kids again uh, they couldn't really always get the piece in by themselves certainly couldn't here is the point where we're able to do that but now we also were giving them some choices here it's not just a one uh, one component of the puzzle. We have several pieces there. Remember now, we said that a child is just now really uh, developmentally ready for this because it's just now able to combine. And so we certainly see that too. One thing that we also mentioned with puzzles is that puzzles are an extension of those earlier cognitive skills that we talked about. Kids started to master again way back in stage two. And so what were those four big skills? Just as a review, remember we said what? We had object permanence, meaning that a child knows that something exists even if I can't see it. We had cause and effect, meaning I know that I can make something happen if I push this button in this toy, the door's going to open, or if I push this button, I'm going to hear the music. They start to really understand that cause and effect. The third one was what? Means to an end. I can pull the string and the toy will come toward me, or uh, even more advanced. I can use something like a drumstick or a coat hanger. If my toy or my shoe is stuck under the couch, I can use something. That tool used to kind of uh, you know, use one object to accomplish another uh, another purpose, so a means to an end. And then the fourth one was problem solving. And again, what does that mean? It just means I can't make this work. How can I make it work? And so that's what puzzles target, that simple problem solving. And so we see a nice advancement there from those earlier stages uh, with, again, not only cognitively, but with the child's fine motor skills. And so now the child can handle a little bit more. So I really love these multiple Melissa and Doug puzzles, and I'm going to talk with you about how to use these puzzles, not only for uh, teaching play skills, but also our language skills. What kinds of things can we do? If you have seen any of my previous uh, videos or DVDs, I use a lot of two and a half gallon Ziploc bags in therapy because I think it just provides such a nice opportunity for children to be able to see what the next toy is, and I nearly always have my toys you know, in the, uh, already in the bag up for the beginning of an activity. And we, again, have a distinct uh, beginning, middle, and end with our toy activity. And it nearly always involves getting the toy out and beginning play that way. And so we might, you know, have them unzip the bag and use a verbal routine like zip, you know, as we're getting it out. And we're going to say open, whether we're using that, you know, again, with a sign or as a word. And so we're going to take the puzzle out and we're going to say something like, look, it's a puzzle. Wow, look at our puzzle. And so then we're going to put the puzzle down and we're going to say something like, oh, I see the pieces. We need to get those pieces out and put the pieces into our puzzle. And so you might, you know, I usually give kids a choice with that, you know, or say something like, you know, it's your turn. You know, who's going to do this? You know, you or me, and they're always going to want to do it. And so, you know, we let them have an opportunity to reach their little hands in and pick a piece. And we say, oh, wow what you get? And so if they're at the point that they can label, and certainly here at stage five, we would want them spontaneously using words to name things. You know, we have a kid here, theoretically, who's at this uh, 19 to 24 month developmental language level and so they're able to name some familiar things and so they would name it. If you have a child who's not at this language level, what are some things you could do? You could get them to try to imitate the sound of the dog. So you would say, you know, what sound does that doggy make? What does he say? And so you might, you know, do woof, woof, woof or ha, ha, ha. 
and have him imitate a pant, you could do that. And then after he's done kind of his language piece, then you're going to work on getting uh, the fine motor component, which is going to be him taking it and getting the piece into the puzzle. And so what do you do when they can't do it? You know, I usually try to show them if they, you know, if they're trying to do a lot of trial and error. And again, that's part of it here. You know, you want a child to learn how, you know, does it go right here? You know, you can do some things like, no, which kids think is hysterical, you know, just by you shaking your head and, you know, saying, you know, a real emphatic, no, no, not there, you know, that kind of thing. And a lot of kids will really pick up that verbal routine and even start to do that purposefully because they think, you, they think that's hysterical that you've said that to them. But again, other things you could do is if they always have a hard time kind of finding the right spot, cover up the choices that are not the correct spot. That's something you could do with that. You could certainly help guide a child's hands. I do a lot of covering up and then a lot of here, here, it goes here. And that's another tip too uh, for helping a child learn how to point, you know, that emphatic tapping. A lot of children will start to do that and you'll see that point kind of emerge. Um, other options that we talked about before for children who can't do these kinds of uh, puzzles yet, children who don't seem interested in these puzzles, what did we talk about? We said that we could use a strategy called deconstruction. And by that I mean that we're going to have the child uh, take apart the puzzle rather than putting it together. So you can use something like a bag. You could even use something... <laughs> Uh, that we talked uh, like a plastic container and so again what's your goal here it's just to have the child deconstruct the puzzle and so instead of him getting the pieces in the right place you might put the put the pieces together even if he doesn't seem that interested in it go ahead and get them in real quick and then you'll say oh let's clean it up come on let's put them in where's the dog find the dog and then help them their goal here is to just deconstruct the puzzle get the pieces uh, out of the puzzle and again some children especially our little friends on the autism spectrum this is a highly effective strategy to introduce a new toy don't focus on on helping them assemble the puzzle or assemble the pieces work on the the deconstruction piece of that and having them take it apart so again you can do it with uh, your bag that you uh, have all your toys in anyway or you can have a separate container like we talked about which again makes it really really obvious uh, when a child is finished with that. And getting finished with a play task for a kid like this is really important too. You know, they they are, um, it's not very interesting to them. They're not very motivated to do it. So having a visual representation of when that task is finished can go a long way in getting some kids to do something they don't naturally want to do. Now, what I wanted to show you with this is, and I mentioned this with the ring stacker example before, a natural thing that's going to happen is once you've had a child take this apart for several sessions or several weeks, guess what he's going to do? He's going to start reaching his hand back in the container and putting the puzzle together himself or doing the constructing piece or the construction piece, which is what you wanted him to do all along, but you've had to add that extra step. It's a super, super effective strategy. If you've never tried it, I hope that you'll give it a try. So let's talk about our language goals with the puzzle too. What are we always working on with language delayed toddlers? It's always what? What are we working on with any toddler? It's always vocabulary development. So we are always, even if a child is not a late talker, focused on teaching new words. And so if a child doesn't have a word, uh, with a, even with a, a, a play, routine like this that we're working on, you know, don't forget about linguistic mapping. And so what does that mean? That means that we are going to give a child the words that he needs to perform the activity. So anytime we see the delight talker, instead of sitting there and going, what's that? Tell me that. What's that? You know, ad nauseum when you know we can't do it, you're driving that child away from you when you're doing that. Go ahead and tell him what the word is. And again, your goal then is what? Is to get a child to imitate what you've said. And so I wanted to be sure to talk about linguistic mapping with this too. With puzzles, one other thing that I want to mention is this is not only an expressive language activity or the talking piece. We also need to target receptive language or helping a child understand what words mean. Now, certainly by age uh, stage five here, 19 to 24 months, 
you know, with a simple puzzle like this, we would really probably naturally expect that a child would already understand uh, these words, already know what cat is and dog and bird. But this is an excellent opportunity for you to specifically focus on receptive language with puzzles. And I told you that, you know, I do that with cleaning up. So we might think about expressive language kind of on the assembly part and receptive language on the, on the deconstruction part or on the cleanup part. And so this is a great great strategy to teach parents and say, you know, this is a great way too to work on following directions. So when you're ready to clean up an activity, have a child clean up those pieces one at a time. So you can say, oh, it's time to clean up. We've got to clean up the puzzle now. You find the bird. Where's the bird? And so you have them get the bird and clean that up, you know, or, you know, where's the cat? And so again, working on that receptive language. And that's a great, great time during cleanup to target those specific skills. Now let's talk about the obvious here for stage five. And as a speech language pathologist, you may be thinking about this. Laura, you said that we were working on phrases, you know, at 19 to 24 months. That's phrase development is what we could be targeting. And you've just talked about single words, and that is certainly true. Here, we can also target uh, phrases with puzzles. And certainly we always wanna keep our language level at what, we're what our goal is and what we're really working on. So we're not gonna take a step back and just do a ton of single words when phrases should be our focus. Now naturally, what's your phrase target that every person with a puzzle is gonna naturally think about? Uh, it's gonna be what? Like dog in, bird in, cat in. But we also have to think about kind of morphological markers. And if you're an SLP, you understand that, uh, you know, and think about that old research, brown stages, you know, and we know that targeting something like a prepositional phrase for a kid, this, it might be a little ahead of where we are. And so we wonder, why isn't this child, you know, using cow in? He's just not really, or bird in, or whatever we're doing. He's just not really there developmentally with that phrase. A lot of times it's that we pick something that's just, we, we think, you know, we're just a little bit ahead of where we should be. And if you think back to Brown's stages, you know, we know that using in and on in a phrase, that that's gonna come in after a child is two, more like 27 to 30 months, right? And so think about that as a therapist. Sometimes the child isn't imitating a particular phrase or using a construction. Again, it's just because he's not there yet. So really make sure that makes sense. So you might say something like, you know, use the, the, the uh, the constructions that we're trying to get here. So something, you know, uh, uh, something else, you know, you're going to use another kind of word there. So it might be, you know, push dog or, uh, uh, you know, big cat or anything like that. So be sure that you're looking at whatever the next kind of language construction should be and so that your targets actually make sense for where a child is with his or her language development. Now, another option uh, for puzzles is a toy like this one. I just love it. It's a new toy for me. It's the Melissa and Doug Barn Puzzle. And again, this is kind of shape sorter-esque. <laughs> Maybe for kids who, uh, maybe you have a kid who likes shape sorters, but you just can't get them over that hump to like puzzles. And again, that, that might be a far-fetched example, but there's some kids out there like that that they just are missing that next little step. I like this little... Uh, toy because it not only is it more like a shape sort or more like a puzzle but they've also got this great door so that you can just you know work on the whole in and out which kids love to do which is a primary activity for toddlers there um, remember we said that any 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 time in toddlerhood a predominant action that kids want to do during play is putting things in and taking them out and so if you can't get a kid to play with puzzles or and that's kind of hard this is a great way to kind of start to target that now most kids are going to opt for the door here because that's the easiest thing but you can certainly show them uh, where the pieces are going to fit here and really teach them how to do that and i think it's a uh, a great way to kind of target this skill and i can't even do it there we go. <laughs> target this skill for kids who are having difficulty with that but puzzles are a fantastic choice for speech therapy moving forward and we're going to begin to talk about uh, using puzzles or continue to talk about puzzles here in this stage but we're going to continue it throughout the rest of this because i have some really cool puzzles to show you as we move through the rest of the stages of play but simple puzzles here at this 19 to 24 month level by 24 months kids can do even more like those six to ten 
piece of uh, wooden inset puzzles but at the beginning of the stage keep it simpler with the three or four piece uh, puzzle options or a toy like this next i want to show you this toy that i think every speech pathologist that i've every video i've watched in the last couple of year has uh, it's Spike the Hedgehog, and it's a great fine motor toy, and again, this is a fabulous toy that if you are working with a child who has difficulty playing with toys because of his interests just aren't there yet, or his cognitive skills, and again, just not there yet, this is a great, great toy that's kind of a transition toy that I've used with a lot of kids to help them learn how to use more pieces. So this toy certainly has lots of pieces, and remember what we said. If we have a child who's having difficulty getting the pieces in, let's say that you've had all the pieces in a container and you're having him do that, and that's just not happening, you should just right in the middle of that activity just stop go ahead and assemble the toy and let it a child really use that as deconstruction if you've never used this before and you start to use it i promise you are going to love it it is a wonderful wonderful strategy for our little friends who for whom uh, play is just really really hard and they are not naturally assembling toys or playing in the anticipated way all right uh, let's talk about the language targets naturally what is any parent going to target or maybe any therapist too when they're working with this toy you're naturally going to talk about those colors and before a child is two we certainly want to expose them to colors so that they can learn those because it is a pre-academic skill and even a language skill that we want children to learn you know again is there too but with our little friends who are late talkers we really need to emphasize functional vocabulary and so a child learning colors and numbers and shapes and letters just not all that important <laughs> when they're not using more functional words uh, during their everyday activities so think about other kinds of things that you can target here uh, i like to say you know like uh, we talked about a, a child using his own name so here you know his let's say his name is ben you know you you might even you know ben do or ben push or uh, you know, uh, whatever, whatever. And so again, that might be another target that you would do besides, you know, red in, green in, orange out, purple out. You know, that gets a little boring sometimes uh, for our little friends who, again, developmentally aren't there learning colors. So think about the other kinds of words that you can say. But this is a fantastic toy to target uh, fine motor development here at that 19 to 24 month level. I love this next little toy. It's a picnic basket. And again, and there's some there's some buttons you can use with some uh, little songs and music on here, but I tend not to use a lot of the buttons and a lot of the electronic uh, perks for a toy, especially in therapy. And I think that a child can do that when he or she would be playing on their own. But this is a great little toy. And again, I think about it as a transition toy for our little friends who, again, have been kind of stuck at the constructive level of play. And they really love shape sorters and they're into that, but they're having difficulty moving on to uh, toys that, again, have more of the pretend component. So they'll be interested in this toy because they're some, you know, they can push the shapes in and out. But you also can introduce that next little step. And remember what else we said uh, for this stage is combining actions that they see their parents do. So certainly like food prep, you know, pretending to get this ready for the baby. And by that, I mean what? They're going to just put it on the plate. This toy comes with kind of a shape sorter little puzzle option uh, for the foods too. But certainly here, we want to get that pretending going. And remember we said that first kids pretend with themselves. So looking at this progression they might pretend they're going to eat the little sandwich themselves the next thing if they're having trouble moving on to feed that baby doll what did we say we said that we want them to uh, include you as their uh, recipient of that play routine so you try to get them to feed you so you say things like can I have a bite oh give it to me or you might even model that where you're taking a bite and then you're having them take a bite and again to really get that reciprocity going Going, where they're turn taking with you and then you pretend like you're going to take a drink <laughs> then you give it to them and they take a drink and then hopefully they're going to take that little cup and do what try to put it back to your mouth and so again even getting that turn taking piece where you're just doing the same 
play routine over and over and over. That's what it takes for a lot of kids to really get that combination piece here where they're, uh, well, not so much combination, but using you as that other, that other uh, play partner there in your play routine, or even the combination where you're really, you know, uh, this would be better with that smaller spoon, but where you're teaching them, oh, I'm going to stir here and then I'm going to give that baby a bite or give you a bite. Where again, you're, you are modeling those combinations uh, for them here in play. And remember, look at what, you know, just all kinds of variations. What can I pretend? I can pretend I'm going to pour. I can pretend I'm going to stir. I can pour this way. Oh my goodness, I put the food on the plate. Oh, I, t I put the food in the cup. You know, again, whatever your combination would happen to be there. And so be sure that you are focused on uh, teaching that. And this is a great little set that's, again, kind of a transition. You can move a kid who's been primarily interested in things like uh, shape sorters or putting things in or, or, again, that more constructive play, even taking it in and, and dumping it out. Help them move on to that next stage where they're including you or including a doll or a character uh, in their play too. Let's talk about a few more ways to target combining when this is not coming as natural or as easily for a child as you would like it to. And then what do we always have to do when something is too hard? What do we say? We say we back up and we make it a lot easier. So instead of using toys like the previous picnic basket toy where we had a lot of different pieces, or if let's say with that toy that the child became super kind of obsessed with, I'm just gonna put the pieces in and take it out that I can't move on to pretending to feed you or pretending to pour in the cup or uh, pretending to feed the baby doll. Make it simpler and use a toy where, again, the actions and the combinations are pretty obvious. So you're still having them put a toy in or take a toy out. But again, we've reduced it because we don't have as many options. And we, uh, again, we've made it simpler, which theoretically is going to make it easier for a child to be able to do. So just think about some really simple combinations you could do. It could just be, you know, making the boy walk and, you know, get up in the bus, taking, the, putting a boy in the bus and then pushing the bus. And again, match your language with this. But when you have a kid who can't, combine ideas. I want to encourage you to make sure that your language is also not overwhelming. And you want him focused on, if, if you're thinking, okay, I can't get him to phrases yet, that language piece, because he doesn't know how to how to do, how to join the actions in play or combine the actions in play or combine the toys. Don't add the language piece. Just focus on uh, the play skill first. So, you know, again, just those simple, simple things, you know. Or let's say we've started with all the people in the bus and we're... we're Watch me and I'll let you know when it's safe to cross. Let's say we're driving the bus. You know, our, our his actions might be driving the bus and then taking a person out and then driving the bus again and taking another person out. And again, don't add too many steps. Don't overwhelm him with language. Oh, Logan, you need to drive the bus to school and get all the kids out. Don't don't say all that. Just keep it super simple. Go, bus. Boy, out. You know, stop, bus. My girl, here's girl. You know, again, keep it simple with, the, with your language, too. Don't make it too complicated. Just think, how can I get this child to use these two toys together? And how can I get them to uh, get him to do kind of maybe what that next little thing is that would come? So think about that. Um, super simple combinations. What do you do if a child is just simply super obsessed with rolling the bus and he throws the people every time you know he never gets there i would say just keep at it keep gently modeling that and kind of you know, this would also be a thing where you might know this is just where we are we're back at stage four we're not ready to combine these toys yet but i'm going to keep trying i'm going to keep showing him not to the point that it makes him mad and it drives him away i'm going to keep giving him uh, more examples so again you just keep at it another thing that you might do is think what else can i do to make this toy more appealing and i know that you've already thought about this but if a kid likes music you're going to sing so maybe you know singing wheels on the bus maybe demoing as we sing what's going on you know the door on the bus goes open and shut open and shut open and shut and again you're getting the kid to hang in there with you you know you're combining open and shut with maybe you know uh, the people are going up and down up and down and again 
he might sit and listen to that and watch that and again have that aha moment where he starts to do that too because you've used music and because you've helped helped uh, him learn that skill with another preference that he already has so let me show you a couple of more toys and and again when i have a kid like this and i think we can't get to phrases this is what i'm going to do for that whole therapy session is just work on these simple simple ways to combine actions uh, in play so let me show you another couple of toys that have worked really well to do that so here I used this example when we were talking about how to join uh, ideas when we and join actions when we were first starting to talk about this at the beginning of the show. So I think a tractor with a trailer is a great option for here. Don't use a really small set. You want to make this obvious with kids. And so you might be looking at your tractor that you've you know, had with another barn set. But do everything you, uh, you can, again, to help a child learn that he's using two toys together in place so when he's got the tractor you immediately say oh where's the farmer or where's the daddy where's daddy daddy's in sit daddy sit sit down daddy and again you've put him in that tractor and and that's that's the combining that's joining two toys together and you know he he tolerates that he learns how to play with that um, other things you can do you know hooking the tractor uh, with the trailer so help show him how to get that trailer hooked on there and I hope that you're going to do it better than I'm doing it here <laughs> now for the demo other simple actions you know again putting uh, the chicken in and then pushing the trailer just any kind of simple combination that you can get him to do uh, a toy fire truck and again why am I showing toys that kind of look the same isn't this sort of the same as the bus absolutely it's the same and that's the point you want to give children a lot of opportunities to practice and really master their ability to be able to join those two toys or at least tolerate you while you show them and while you model and you're playing with them and you're putting the fireman in there and you're pushing the truck and so you're showing them how to join those two things together that's what you do when you have a child who again is having that difficulty combining look at what he likes to do pick the simplest kinds of things that you can within his kind of range of what he'll tolerate and what he'll pay attention to to show him how to do that but these little vehicles and characters in vehicles with simple simple things to do that's the way to go when you're having a child who's having difficulty with that And let me wrap this up. I forgot to say this. What's your play goal? Why are we doing this? Why are we combining these two actions? It's so that we can get him there with words. And so until the child is able to use two toys together or uh, put uh, join two actions together, you know, first I'm going to put the man in and then I'm going to drive the tractor. Or first, you know, I'm going to take this chicken out and then make the chicken walk. Or, or whatever it happens to be. Until they can do those things non-verbally, they're not going to be able to do this verbally. So we have to teach kids how to, how to cognitively join these ideas together and we do this concretely first in play before we attempt to do it with words. Another great option for this stage of play is a toy with a gross motor component. So why is that? Because we know that children who are in their, their last half of the year that they learn how to walk, and so again, for typically developing children 19 to 24 months, again, they are still obsessed with moving around while they play, and sit down play may actually be harder for them because of that drive to move, move, move. So anytime we can incorporate a gross motor activity with play uh, we know that we will probably have a better uh, chance of them sustaining that play and a better chance with attention so this is a new toy that I found it's called the Papa Balls push and pop bulldozer and I know it's gonna be a hit and remember here we're not just walking around with toys what was our main uh, goal It's combining play action so I love that this toy is again so motivating for that a child can put the balls in um, and the, the as they push the scooper watch what happens with the scooper as they push the toy it lifts and dumps it in and also shoots them out so super super way uh, to engage a child and I haven't talked about this in this uh, course today so let's talk about how to organize 
uh, your sessions for children who do have those issues with needing to move. We call those little friends sensory seekers because they're busy kids who, again, their little systems drive them to be up and moving around rather than sitting down. So when we structure therapy for a child like this, I like to think about it as we're going to move and then we're going to sit and we're going to move and we're going to sit. So this might be the toy that we play with during the move a portion of that. We might also do a social game like chase or ringing around the rosies or something like that. But when we have lots and lots of sit-down activities for children like this, we often lose their attention. So if we can purposefully include uh, toy options for children so that they can naturally have those opportunities to move around, we'll see that their attention span increases not only for when they're able to get up and move around with a cool toy like this, but also then when they're able to sit down with you with that next sit-down toy. And then when they tire of that you finish that toy or a toy or two in a row then think about i'm going to get up and move around again so again super super cute toy uh for this kind of thing we also reviewed some other uh, toys like that back in stage four we had those vacuums that we looked at or even back in stage three when we had toys that we uh, were teaching means to an end and we had the string toys that we could pull those are fantastic options to pull back out <laughs> and use for your little friends who can't sit down with you for more than five minutes or so and again that's kind of developmentally appropriate for where they are for this stage in development even if they're much older think about that as you're planning this and even as you're thinking oh we're really gonna you know just hone in on these play skills think I'm still going to need to give him some opportunities to get up and move around so that he can have better attention so this is a fantastic uh, toy for that it's a new toy for me I can't wait to use it so I hope that it's going to be good not only for you but for me too <laughs> now let's take some time and look at some toys with lots of opportunities for combining let's say that you've gotten a child through uh, the stages that we've talked about with some simpler toys and now he or she is ready to move on and do lots of other things. Baby doll sets are a wonderful option not, not only for little girls but for little boys too. They give you so many opportunities for learning to use two related toys together, for learning to combine familiar play actions, not only with what a child might do, but also for including those activities that he sees another familiar person do, which is what we're focused on here in this stage. So super, super, super uh, good toy for lots of opportunities uh, here. So let's talk about this. Can you buy some pre-packaged baby doll sets? Of course you can. I got many of these pieces. I think uh, this was a Dollar General set and it was just the little, I think it just came with the diapers and maybe the bottles, but you can go ahead and add to it. And this is a great idea for your families that uh, don't have a lot of resources. And I always think, well, if they have a doll for a kid, I can help that mom make a baby doll set. So even go in the kitchen and just get, you know, let's say to mom, let's, let's just come up with your own little set for working on this here with the, here with your child. And you're going to be able to put all these toys together and then let's talk about how you can use these toys. And then you always say what your goal is. You say, you know, we're helping her learn how to use these actions together and learn how to use these toys together so that she can join these ideas because we want her to understand how to join words and make longer and longer sentences so she she can talk better and better and so parents understand that but you've got to explain that not just one time but keep explaining it and keep really you know driving your message home with what your goals are for this stage so back to my point about assembling a baby doll set so get help them find just some kind of little bag and you know again don't be shy about this just say you know i want to help you put this together so that you can use this in your own one-on-one -on -one play time with your child this week and when you're thinking about your your you know mommy therapy time or your speech therapy time here at home this is what i want y'all to focus on this week and gather those toys go with them and say you know let can we find a little hairbrush can we find a bowl can we get a little spoon and parents then become kind of excited and take some ownership 
relationship about putting this kind of thing together so that they have a little therapy kit uh, to play with their child. And again, not every parent's going to get super excited about this, but I found that most of them do because you're showing them how to use their own resources and help them know what to do when you are not there <laughs> to help work on play and language development with their child. And so again, help them assemble a baby doll set, the things that I typically say, and I think I have this written on your handout, but a cup, a bowl, a spoon, a bottle if you have it, a hairbrush, a toothbrush, a blanket, a diaper, if you know, even their own child's diaper, even if it's a lot bigger than the baby doll, who cares? You know, that's hysterical for a toddler. You can model how to get it on there and then certainly how to take it off. They're going to think that's a lot of fun. Even things like including real lotion or band-aids, you know, something that again would capture a child's attention and you want them just to stay with you for longer and longer periods of time so that you can work on these play skills and as well as their language so remember what we said our primary strategy is it's always what adult modeling <laughs> so you are going to show them how to play so you're going to actually sit down with them and play with the baby doll and talk about it you know so you're going to say something like oh your baby's so thirsty look I can't get the top off. Look, here's her bottle. Oh, baby, drink, baby. And you show them, you know, and you're, you're modeling the whole time, you know. <laughs> ah, it's so good. Oh, baby, baby drinks. And whatever your language level is, and conceivably here at stage five, we're talking about phrases. So you just continue to model as many phrases as you can within that play routine so that <laughs> the child will begin to imitate those phrases and then self-generate those phrases too. So super, super way to work on using two related toys together, to work on uh, sequencing uh, one familiar action with another familiar action, and then certainly also to work on including another person or object as a passive recipient. Now don't forget what I said about if a kid can't use a baby doll, what should you do? You get the child to have you as the passive recipient in play. So let's say that a child just isn't interested in this at all. What kinds of things can you do? We talked about this back in the previous shows with our Pretend With Me backpacks. You take out those items one at a time and you show a child what to do with it. You say, you know, oh, scrubby, that's for washing. I wash, wash arm, wash face wash leg and again you model that and then you hand it to the child for him to have an opportunity to do those things too and you narrate his play using those uh what again whatever language level he's at and again here it's phrases you do that with him and then what do you do you encourage him to use that on you so as he's washing then you stick your arm out and you say wash me my arm my arm wash mine Look, look, see, wash, 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 wash Laura, Laura's arm. And you, again, model that, model the right language level and model that action. So it's a super, super way to get that going. And let me mention one more thing. We talked about uh, how great that little poppin' bulldozer was. Don't, uh, for a gross motor, for a gross motor toy to kind of combine and get a kid hooked in with that. I've had great luck here with baby doll strollers or a baby doll high chair or a baby doll bed where there's another accessory and we're helping a child make that leap to combining with a bigger life size or real realistic, lifelike prop. So uh, you put the baby doll in the stroller and then have him push the baby doll. That's so, so fun for a kid who, again, is at that, that stage where he has that developmental drive to move. That's a great way to include it. All right, I have one more toy I want to show you to talk about, and that's coming up next. Now I want to show you one more toy that you can use here at this developmental uh, range and for all the next age ranges or stages to come because it's super, super fun for kids, again, who are, who are toddlers or preschoolers. So this is called Counting Surprise Party. I don't know if you can see all my little uh, boxes here. I'm not sure about the shot if you can see all those, but these are just little boxes 
that look like gifts or presents and then you open them and there's a small toy inside now naturally let me go ahead and give the precautionary word that if you have children who are still mouthing a lot of objects you are naturally not going to use this toy without hands-on constant adult supervision because some of these toys probably are a choke hazard but it's a super fun uh, super fun way for kids to name lots of things and again for our late talkers we're working on phrases but for lots of kids who are in this range and again uh, uh, we're talking about our little friends with language delays here they're still going to be doing lots and lots of naming and lots and lots of learning new words so a super super uh, way to keep them uh, in involved in this kind of task it is just fantastic for kids who again uh, who are learning to name so this is my replacement toy for my ancient tupperware blocks i wanted to try to find one of those today but i I, I've had those toys for so long I can't even find them but this is a great great replacement for this kind of thing now with children beyond naming uh, the single items that are in here and there's a big variety this is a learning resources toy and I think they've done such a nice job with that you know there's a teapot and there's some simpler things like kitty cat you know other animals um, you can also for our little friends who are just adult language learners you can also use uh, this kind of thing for kids again to start to get them to talk and with our little friends like that if we are not using their carrier phrases or again their their little uh, their little preferred patterns there sometimes we don't hear a lot of words you know you you're naming teapot cat frog or dinosaur I'm sorry dinosaur but then you start to use uh, a little holistic phrase like it's a dinosaur it's a cat it's a teapot you'll start to hear them those kinds of kids use a lot more language because you met them where they are and you've used their language learning preference which is what a chunk <laughs> and you're helping them learn how to interchange take some of those words out and put a new word in so super super way to do that and again uh, use your voice to build anticipation if you have a kid that's not a great confrontation namer you know even just a child with that's not on the spectrum who's not a just alt language learner even just a child who again maybe a, a child with markers for apraxia and they almost need kind of a, a lead in to get that word going it's a super super way to do it you can build anticipation with your voice you can say something like oh what's that listen 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 what's that let's open 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 the box oh <gasps> it's a robot and again sometimes you don't even have to do the the filling in you know you're doing a fill in the blank there uh, a verbal routine where you're starting the it's a uh, and you've given them kind of that running start and then they are able to fill in with that last word but to open the box and say what's that you know you're going to be uh it's going to be harder for them they don't do not respond with the same level uh of uh participation the same consistency is when you set them up and kind of give them that anchor phrase to sort of get them going so i love this therapy activity now if you think i do not want to uh, buy that particular toy this is a great idea but what can i do i've seen these little boxes like this just at a uh, dollar tree you know through christmas and so make your own little sets but find something like this because i think it's a super super way to practice naming for kids who are kind of still at that single word level you can certainly continue to target phrases with this you know which is what we're supposed to be targeting here at stage five uh, but certainly um you know you can you can uh, continue to uh, set those up too most like talkers are naturally uh, going to begin to include uh, words that they already use in phrases before they use new words so think about that we target new words as single words and then we uh, target phrases using those existing words from a child's vocabulary so that's another uh, thing that I wanted to make sure that we mentioned one more thing that I forgot to mention when we were talking about I think back at the baby dolls is I wanted to talk a little bit about when we're using phrases to be really really careful that we don't as speech language pathologists fall into telegraphic speech and so what is telegraphic speech it's where we continuously model grammatically incorrect phrases just to try to get the two word phrase and so again it sounds a little bit unnatural instead of saying um, like with our baby you know the baby is cold 
we say something like baby cold or cold baby, and that's okay, and that's certainly what a child is going to say when he's at the phrase level. But as adult models, it's not evidence-based practice to leave out all the little words. So be sure that you're thinking about that as a therapist, even if you, again, are driving those phrases home. We always, and you're constantly modeling those two-word phrases, we always want to think about what the research is telling us. So we know that it's going to be harder for our little friends, especially those who are on the spectrum, who are just all language learners or echolalic, if you're still kind of thinking about it like that. We'll go ahead and use use those uh, cor correct grammar, uh, use our articles like the, use our, our auxiliary verbs like is, we're, we're going to do that child uh, more, uh, it's just more of a benefit to not use telegraphic speech all the time. It's going to be harder for them to make that leap to more adult-like language if they we've only focused on telegraphic speech. So be careful of that. And I think sometimes we get stuck with that, especially here uh, when we're really thinking about modeling phrases. That happens a lot. So I just wanted to mention that just to be sure that we're current and always looking at evidence-based practice. All right, that is it for today for this show for Stage 5. Be sure that you are looking, if you want to look at some of these toys a little further or purchase some of these toys, I have the links below right here on YouTube. If you are listening to this podcast on your podcast app, you can find out the list for toys by finding the video on YouTube uh, with our channel at Teach Me To Talk or by going to my website. Now, this is show number 470 if you want to get credit for that. And again, you can just go to my website at Teach Me To Talk and type in show 470 in the teeny tiny a little search bar at the top and you can find out that information or go to the ASHA credit uh, big banner that's right there on the home page. All right, if you need more ideas for working with children who are language delayed and you need some real resources, I'm going to take just a minute to introduce you to my therapy manuals where you can find step-by-step -step instructions for working with all kinds of late talkers. My first manual is this one. It's my newest book. I'm so excited about it. It's the Late Talker Work book and you'll find three evidence-based approaches or plans for working with a late talker and this is primarily for children who are already two years old and for children who can imitate that's who um that's the, the, that's who plan a is directed for in this book but if you are a therapists working with parents and doing lots of caregiver training and you need some help with that plan b in this workbook is full of tools for you and if you are a parent just working with your child at home and you think i need something more therapy like i need step-by-step -step instructions i want somebody to tell me exactly how to do it this is your tool for that so it's called the late talker workbook and you can find that link right there below if you're working with a child or parenting a child who has autism and you want a comprehensive plan for, again, helping you know what to do first, what to look at second, what's going to come next for you. You want some real guidance for helping you decide exactly what skills to work on at home or in therapy. The Autism Workbook walks you through a 12-focus plan that will help you dive in and determine exactly what a child with autism or markers for autism is missing, and then lots and lots of directions and activities to help you teach that skill and help that child master whatever that difference has been that's helping him not be able to communicate. So great, great tool there. Teach Me to Play With You is a fantastic starting point if you are working with a late talker who, again, is not very engaged with you. You try to do these toys. They're just not there yet. Back up and work on social games. So Teach Me to Play With You outlines those social games and also walks through beginning toys and how to really work on that that interaction piece so that a child becomes more communicative with just by staying with you and by learning to do his part. So super, super resource for you. And then lastly, I want to mention what's probably my favorite resource I have at Teach Me to Talk for children who are not talking and when it is just still a mystery to you as to what's going on with this kid. Let's talk about talking walks through the 11 pre-linguistic skills that all toddlers master when they are learning to use words. And so you can take this checklist and figure out, oh, my child does this and my child does this, but he does not do this yet. And then there's a whole chapter of guidance and instruction 
instructions to help you teach your child how to master that skill. And again, these 11 things are, are, are things that all children learn before they begin to use words. So if you have a kid who's stuck that you think, I just don't know what to do next, get yourself a copy of Let's Talk About Talking, and I know that's going to help you. All right, that's all for today for Stage 5. I can't wait for Stage 6 because then we start to get to the really cool toys. So I hope that you'll uh, join me for that next show in our series. But that's all for today. I'm Laura Mize, Pediatric Speech-Language Pathologist, and thanks so much for watching and participating in Teach Me to Talk's podcast. <music>